He was ordained and installed the 13th Bishop of the Charleston Catholic Diocese on March 25, 2009. And five years later, Bishop Robert Guillermo Monet is still going strong. I had a chance to talk exclusively with him for the special edition of Quentin's Close Ups. Well, Bishop Guillermo Monet. That's very good. Yes. <laughs> I want to begin with some uh, good news, that is. Mm -hmm. And I believe on, uh, on January 30th, it was announced that the diocese would open up a new parish in Daniel Allen. Yes. Put on your thinking hat for me and tell me why Daniel Allen. Because there's an increasing number of Catholics who are living there. And, um, you know, they, they have to travel a distance to get to the nearest churches, which would either be, you know, Christ our King in Mount Pleasant mm -hmm. or Stella Maris on Sullivan's Island. So, um, you know, there is a certain need to, um, to create a parish where Catholics are, so that's the reason why we're. Besides that, we've been looking at this for many, many years. You know, so ever since we put Bishop Engel High School out there, that's right. We've been looking at the possibility of the church out there. And speaking of expanding, let's talk about the new building that you guys just broke back in the actually, which is in October of 2013. Right, right. It's the yeah. Talk to me more about that. Well, uh, obviously, it's a, a possibility of bringing people who are working in a lot of different locations for the diocese into one place. Yeah. Uh, we have this building where we're here, right. uh, we have people across the street, uh, we have people across the river, right. <laughs> we have people all over the place. And um, in many cases, they may know of each other and have contact by telephone or various ways, but they don't have the opportunity to come together. And we just feel um, with that need and looking at all the buildings we have right now which are in need of some real you know, tender loving care, uh, we figured the best way to do this would be to create a new building. It's the first time in the diocese's history yes. that we're actually building a pastoral center. And I was reading somewhere in an article in which you said that investing in this will be investing in the future. Absolutely. So tell me, going forward, what is the vision for the diocese? Well, we are growing. We're growing tremendously. And um, so as, as we grow, we try to meet the needs of the Catholics who are you know, uh, coming into uh, South Carolina, and as we as we look at the increased numbers and the increased services that will be required, we can foresee for the next good number of years that we're going to have to look at expanding our ability to serve these people. And certainly, in your vision, you did not see the abuse of all the Catholic children. Well, you know, uh, it, it's something that was was a horrible thing that happened. Uh, there's no question about that, but. Uh, I think we've taken some real strong steps in terms of, uh, of combating uh, the problem and not only combating the problem within the church, but helping people to realize that this is a serious problem for our society as well. And as we talk about sadness on a different level, let's go back to November 24th. I'm wondering where were you when you heard that Bishop David Thompson actually died? Actually, uh, I was up in, uh, in Myrtle Beach. Yeah. and. Uh, preparing for a confirmation uh, up there when I got the phone call that, uh, that uh, Bishop Thompson had died. You know, that was, did you know him? Read about him. Oh, I think he was a good guy. He was a really fine, fine human being, good priest, good bishop. We're going to miss him a lot. Oh, yeah. And as you know, David was the 11th bishop from 1990 until 1999. And it's interesting because as we sit here right now, and as I was telling Maria, I go to the cathedral almost every day. Good, bad times, I'm there. And as I go in and out, I always see the plaque of all the bishops on there. Of course, bishop's name is on there, as well as yours. Take me back to March 25th, 2009, that is. What was your memory of actually becoming a bishop on that particular day? Oh, well, that was an exciting day, I must say. Um, exciting in a lot of ways. I mean, exciting, first of all, to be to come to Charleston, Charleston. to be the, uh, the bishop of, uh, of the diocese, you know, encompassing the whole state of yeah. South Carolina. Uh, certainly uh, exciting in terms of just, you know, being asked to be a bishop by, by the Holy Father. That's right. And then, of course, you know, coming here and seeing the, the wonderful response of the people was just a really, really nice uh, occurrence. And looking, of course, and seeing the, uh, you know, the cathedral at that time, if you recall, uh, the cathedral was surrounded by scaffolding That's because true. it was in the last, uh, I guess, stages of its uh, 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 renovation and Reorganization, yes. And you know, I want to pick apart your uh, appointment day statement, which you you know said back in 2009. And something that stuck out stuck out to me that is, mm -hmm. 
It says, quote, the Holy Father wrote that as this was the case for the John the Baptist, that he decreased while Jesus increases. So too is the case for the priests. This model of priesthood embodied in the John the Baptist was occupying my mind when my cell phone rang. Isn't it true that you were taking a walk with your dog? I was. <laughs> yeah. I was. And uh, I still take walks with my dog, that same dog. Mickey? Yes, yeah. Mickey. In fact, he's probably asleep in the other room. Oh, yeah. I see him. He's an old man at this oh, point. But, yeah. uh, no, but what I would do uh, very, very frequently, I would take him for long walks. And it was an occasion for me to reflect, to pray. Um, you know, we'd go to parks and various different beautiful places because um, I wanted those walks to be times that I could enter into some really serious reflection. So yes, that was one of the things that I was thinking about. And talking about God directing our steps, in your situation, He was really directing your steps to the last minute. Well, there's no question about that. I really believe that every step is, is, is uh, in, including the presence of God. And of course, for us, it's our choice as to whether or not we're going to walk with God or not. That's true. That's, true. Yeah, that, that's our choice. That's right. And, you know, when you were coming here, I understand that, you know, of course, Pope, uh, Pope Benedict, that is, actually in, in gave you this opportunity. But you were a little apprehensive. Well, I didn't know anything about South Carolina. Right. Uh, that was uh, part of it. <laughs> Secondly, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't one of these younger priests. Sure. I mean, I was a little bit older than most bishops would be named. And I was saying, my goodness, I was looking where I had been assigned as my last assignment before retirement. So it was a surprise. And then, of course, just wondering, what can I bring to South Carolina, you know, not having had any experience in the state? But I've discovered that uh, it, it's been a good, good five years. And isn't it true, the messenger, when he told you Charleston, you asked, what Charleston? Well, yeah, because you know there is another Charleston. There's another diocese of Charleston that's right, that's right. in West Virginia, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, but this is the Charleston. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and I know that, you know, you do a lot of visualization, and when you were actually walking Mickey at some point, uh, you wanted to really learn more about Charleston, and you started visualizing, because you didn't want to go anywhere where it was cold, and you felt like Charleston is a way good place for that, as far as, you know, more well, activities. Obvious, well, you obviously, you know, you, you, you say you want to know as much as you can. So, with the internet, of course, you know, you just go in, and you Google Charleston, South Carolina, and there's all kinds of possibilities, you know. And of course, I knew something about it in yeah. terms of history and, you know, the, uh, the war between the states and all of those things. Right. But uh, I needed to know a lot more. And of course, no matter what you do in terms of preparation, it's not the same thing as actually being here. That's right. <laughs> After five years, I can say, I have a pretty good understanding of uh, not only Charleston, yes. uh, but certainly the entire state. And when you got chosen, you still have to focus on Rockville Center. Uh, I know you, you actually were a rector there and you took some other positions before then. Mm -hmm. Walk me down memory lane and talk to me about your time there. When Rockwell Center? Yeah. Yeah, well, that was a great parish. A, okay. A wonderful parish. Unfortunately, I was only there 18 months. Right. So, uh, being a very large parish, I never really got to know a lot of people there, which was a real disappointment because, um, you know, I, I, my previous pastor, I had been there 11 years. Yes. And, you know, 11 years. You really get in touch with the people. Yeah, and it's in Rock, well actually Rockville Center is in Long Island, on right. Long Island I should say, and that's where uh, home was for you. Well, uh, that diocese of Rockville Center, you know, but I grew up further east, in right. a little town called Nasty Beach. Yes. Yeah, so. Talk to me about that because I read that you actually went to Catholic grade school as well, high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and Catholic college. So yeah. first time I set foot in a public school was when I was teaching in public school. That's right. But uh, yeah, so no, it uh, it was good. It was a small town. Now, of course, <laughs> you know, fifty years later, it's yeah. not a small town anymore. Yeah. Now. And you know, New York is really home of for immigrants, as you know, because your father actually came from Italy to New York. Actually, he came to Boston. Okay. Uh, we discovered. We all thought that he landed in New York. Okay. We discovered. Well, not really, um, because my great niece just did one of those. Uh, you know, searches for ancestors right. and discovered that what we had thought all of these years was in error. Oh, horrible. No, he came to Boston. Okay, because <laughs> I was reading my research that, you know, so I'm glad you corrected me. Now, my mother came to New York. Okay. Uh, and, and she, she was an act, a, a avid reader. Oh, yes, absolutely. But she came through Ellis Island. He okay. Did, you know, in Boston. So 
And I want to talk more about your mom because, like I indicated earlier, she was an avid reader. Right. And she really studied things like Civil War and self and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, did you, and I know too that you actually have a reading passion. So tell me this, uh, did you get the reading bug from her? Well, I don't know where it came from. Uh, although recently I don't do as much reading as I used to because um, I've discovered the time constraints. So, but I do, I do. I must say that I've probably gone through, oh, in the last uh, two or three years, probably about 65 novels. Wow. But I do it on audiobooks. Books. I spend yes. so much time in the car. Oh, yeah. So, James Patterson, yes. you know. And then, of course, I had to learn more about this area. So, Dorothy Benton Frank. That's right. And Pat Conroy. Oh, right. And, you know, the local authors as well as, you know, Vince Flynn and, yes. uh, you know, a lot of those things. But audiobooks are great because um, since I spent so much time in the car, that's a good opportunity for me to really catch up with things. And isn't it true that your mom named you after Robert F. Lee? Robert E. Lee. Pardon me, I'm pardon me. Uh -huh. Are you a Southerner? <laughs> <laughs> Not. <laughs> I was going to say, my goodness gracious, if you thought it was Robert F. Lee. <laughs> no, she, uh, she, was reading, she was reading about the Civil War. And, um, and of course, he, so was Robert E. Lee. Yes. But, and she really thought his middle name was Eric, which oh. is what I am. Right. Unfortunately, she was in error. Uh, his middle name is Edward. Okay. Uh, Robert E. Yes. So, yes. So I guess that was a little help in some of the Southerners accepting this man, you know, who's named after Robert E. Lee. Yes. <laughs> Another story that you have to tell is that moving from the city to what they call the country. Uh, tell me, what was your secret to adjusting to that? What do you mean? When I moved from New York City out to the country, right. I was only three years old. Yeah. There was no adjustment. Okay. Well, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is this. What story did your mom and father told you about that? About moving? Just that my father wanted to enter into business, and he had an opportunity out in, uh, uh, out in this town, Nasty Beach, and that was the reason we moved. We had had a summer place there. You know, it was a, a community, beach community, similar to what Sullivan's Island would be here. Yeah. And... Uh, but then when the, the business opportunity uh, occurred, we just moved out there permanently. But I was only three years old at the time, so I don't even know. Oh, no, 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 no worries, don't worry about it. <laughs> Let's talk about this. Um, as you mentioned earlier, you went to St. John's University. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering who you were as a college student. Who I was? Right. Were you adventurous? Were you academics? Because, I mean, I ask those questions all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, well first of all, you've got to realize that this was, you know, in the late 50s, uh, and you know, that I, I, I finished high school and uh, and then 60s. So, but I was not a druggie, okay, yeah. even though okay. most folks, most colleges uh, were there. But I wasn't, a, I guess, what you would call a real academic either. Okay. I was just a, you know, a typical student. Had good friends. Of course, of course those were the years from St. John's and yeah. uh, basketball, or, uh, you know, uh, at the high. So I enjoyed it. I enjoyed basketball games uh, at the university. That was, that was great. And I had an opportunity to be living in the city of New York during those years. Yeah. And I was living only four or five blocks away from the, uh, the World's Fair in, in, uh, in Flushing. So it was kind of nice to be so close to the 1964 World's Fair. And once you finished you know, St. John's, as you mentioned earlier, you became a teacher for five years. Right. I'm wondering, what was that like? Well, it was great. I enjoyed teaching. And uh, I taught high school, mostly juniors and seniors in right. high school. And um, that was a, a great opportunity. I taught business subjects you know, um, business law and, okay. uh, and uh, accounting and record keeping and, uh, um, you know, salesmanship and things like that. That was a good experience. And during that time, you actually went back to uh, school. You went for graduate work at NYU. Right, I did. How did you juggle both? Oh, well, come on, people do that all the time, you know, they, you know. And it's not a silly question, it's just some people have different Well, no, the thing is, of course, uh, I don't know what the requirements are here in South Carolina in terms of education. But in New York, you had the obligation um, to, um, to work toward your master's degree before right. you could have permanent certification. Right. Yeah. So I had to go for other courses. And NYU was offering some courses that I thought were kind of interesting. So, yeah. uh, and of course, I always loved going into New York City. I, mean, yeah. that was, uh, I still do. Yeah. Yeah. Pizza, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. and the theater. Yeah, that's true. I love, I love the theater. Yes. And uh, so every time I go back to New York, that's one of the things I do is try to pick up a play. And from my understanding, you actually had a, a call to go and do pre-search. I'm sorry, say that again? You, what I'm saying is that you felt like you had a call to pre-search. To pre-search? Yeah, yes, my, 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 y
Yeah. That would have been, um, I guess, even before I started teaching. Yeah. But it just got stronger while I was teaching, and yeah. uh, so I decided, well, I better check this out, which I did. Because I know that teaching was your passion, but you said that something was missing. There was something missing, because it had always been in my mind, and so I said I ought to really try to see, you know, is this, is this what uh, what God really wants for me? Well, fill in the blanks for me. Being a fourth degree Knight of Columbus is. Well, that's the highest degree in the Knights, and I had joined the Knights, oh, even before, uh, I guess when I started college, I right. joined the Knights. And uh, I guess I had gone through the first and second and third degrees. And then I didn't go through a fourth degree until I came down here to, to, uh, to, uh, to South Carolina. But, you know, the Knights of Columbus are very active here in the they state, are. and uh, they kept asking and asking and asking. I said, okay, let me do this. Yes. Go for the fourth degree. You know, that is the highest degree, and it's, it's based on uh, not only, you know, the, the, the loyalty and the, the, the friendship and the, uh, certainly the uh, faithfulness, but right. also on patriotism, which, which the fourth degree, you know, focuses on. Yeah. Being named a prelate of honor by Pope John Paul II in 1996 was? Well, uh, prelate of honor is basically, you know, uh, given the title Monsignor. Uh, which, of course, as you know, uh, Pope Francis has just said, no more. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So yes, but that was that was a wonderful honor, and uh, uh, it was given while I was pastor of, of, of the parish, but also dean of the local deanery. Yeah. So, Pope John Paul II's passing was. Oh, that was that was a those were tough times. His whole the last year of his life was was tough. I mean, yeah. to see to see the Pope in such uh, pain. such pain and suffering, you know. So, uh, but I mean, he. Uh, he remained faithful, and uh, yeah, we, we we suffered through his suffering, and also, uh, I guess, the loss uh, when he died. But it was kind of a blessing when he died. I think you know people were also kind of relieved, saying this poor man has suffered a lot. You know, it's good that we took him home. And he's in heaven now. Yeah, I certainly believe that. He's going to be canonized the same. That's right. Few weeks. That's right. That's going to be exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about Pope Benedict and his legacy. Mm -hmm. hey. Well, to tell you the truth, I, I, I only met him, you know, formally since I was uh, the bishop here. Okay. And um, Pope Benedict probably would be considered one of the best teachers we've had as Pope for a long time. He, uh, John Paul was uh, a great evangelizer, but when John Paul wrote, uh, it was very difficult to really, you know, allow his writings to enter into you. You had to really work. work it, yeah. Benedict was much easier. He was a he was a, a natural teacher, and he he was able to present things in a way that he really wanted people to understand easily. So I found that his writings uh, were were much easier, and he was a good teacher. Yes. I think he found the pressures of the office, uh, the fact of his age, and uh, he had indicated that uh, he just felt for the good of the church it would be better if someone else were to take on the responsibility. Pope Francis will be. Oh yeah, my goodness! Uh, Pope Francis has done some tremendous things. He's excited people yes. you know, with, with the uh, social media. Oh, everything! Um, I mean, every day there just seems to be something in terms of uh, both the social media and the general media, and a lot of it very, very positive, and some of it very, very challenging. You know? Yeah. Especially, you know, his call, you know, in terms of our outreach to the poor. He's reminding us, you know, uh, how important that is. Scouting is. Mm. Yes. Oh, you're covering all the topics here. Oh, yeah. Okay, yes. That's what i got to do, man. i got to do that. <laughs> got to give people what they need and what they want. Well, you know, uh, I, I have been involved in scouting in, uh, oh my goodness, almost yeah. 40 years now. And uh, I just found it's a really good program for young people. And, uh, and I just believe that the church should be involved in it because in the United States, we have uh, almost uh, 800,000 young people of our faith involved in scouting. Not, not even, I, I should clarify that. 800,000 Catholics, young and old, involved right. in scouting. Right. So that's a lot of people, and that's why I think it's important for the church to be present to it. Yeah, Mickey is. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> Mickey's been to many uh, many a scout camp, I'll tell you. You know, he, he does a great job. Uh, although, you know, these days, he just sort of takes life easy. You know, when you're an old man, man like he is, things slow down a bit. Yeah, it does indeed. God is. I'm sorry. No. God is. Fill in the blank. God is. 
Oh, you want me to fill in the blank? I didn't know what you were talking about. No, no, it's all good. Don't worry about it. Oh, I'm a, yeah, I wasn't sure what you were asking. <laughs> no, God no is well. God is omnipresent. Yes. Uh, God is good. He is. And God is challenged. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I would have to say that, uh, you know, uh, God provides the opportunity for us not simply to survive, but to thrive as we travel this journey of life. Mm -hmm. so. Robert is. Oh, at this point, pretty happy with the way things are. Uh, finding, you know, tremendous challenges in a growing diocese. Uh, oh my goodness, it's, uh, uh, but it's, uh, it's good, it's good. And I would have to say that I'm basically a, a, a very satisfied, happy human being. Yes, indeed. Well, you know, listen, you had a special message for people uh, in, during Christmas time, and I want to reread that to you. You said, quote, people seem to be searching for an inner peace in their hearts. I think we are a people walking in hope, and I think Christmas can bring that hope if we focus on what the real meaning of the season is. We are in the second month of the 2014 season. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, what's your message to the folks for this new year? Well, I would hope that 2014 can be a year where we would find a deeper sense of that inner peace. You know, There are a lot of things in this world in which we live uh, that bring about discord and, yeah. and difficult times. and. Um, I find that sometimes people are, uh, are so affected by all that's going on around them that sometimes uh, anger increases, uh, yeah, and, and a lot of discord among people. I would love to see people getting along a lot better, being more civil with each other, even when we disagree, because we're not going to agree on everything, but that doesn't mean we have to... We have to fight with the people with whom we disagree. So I would hope for a sense of peace, civility, understanding, tolerance in all of these areas. Yeah. And finally, let's talk about your next chapter. What do you want God to bring into your next chapter? Oh my goodness, I don't know. I would just hope that he would bring a sense of, uh, of accomplishment to what we are trying to do here in South Carolina. What we're trying to do is to raise the level of people's happiness of people's spirituality, of, of people's ability to live a good, wholesome life. And whatever the Catholic Church can do to help that um, you know, occur, to, to, to do what we can to make sure that people have the opportunity to do those things, sure. that would be my hope. Yes. And uh, we'll just keep working at it. Well, Bishop, it was so great talking to you. Quentin, thank you. Thank nice you. talking with you. Likewise. Okay. I appreciate that.